All right, I want to make a couple more comments on this whole insurance thing. There were some things that we did not talk about, some points that we left out. Uh, it wasn't intended to be a real exhaustive study, but uh, there were a lot of questions brought up, so I'm going to be answering some of those questions, some of the objections that were raised, uh, because it is an important subject. A lot of people say, oh, it's not that important. Oh, it's very important. I'm going to talk about this, but let's start out here in, in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 9. Um, the Bible says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Okay? Now, I'm not calling you all a bunch of fools or anything else, so don't get excited. You're probably already pausing the video so you can type nasty comments. You know? Uh, I think a lot of you were very hasty in the way that you responded to that study. I can guarantee you by a lot of the comments I saw, there was not much prayer being done on a lot of your parts, those of you who are for insurance, um, pray about these things. You know, uh, we were not making the video to say that uh, you're not saved if you have insurance. I think there's a lot of Christians that are saved and they have insurance. Uh, that doesn't mean that insurance is right. Okay? A lot of people are doing things, a lot of saved people do a lot of things that are sinful and wrong. And I do believe that insurance is a sin. It's not a sin that will keep you from salvation, let me say that. And let me clarify another thing that was brought up in some of the comments, and that is that uh, our stands against people in the military, our stand against people that go to Babel buildings. Well, we're talking about unrepentant people, all right? Uh, people that work for the government that are continually put through diversity training and through all the other stuff, and they can't say anything about sodomites, and they can't, they're forced, their speech is, is uh, censored. Working for the federal government, eh, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to get you out of that situation eventually. But uh, that's why we say you have people that, you know, we knew of a situation when we were in Gasland. There was some people that we had acquaintance, you know, they were acquaintances, and this guy was like a high-ranking military official, and he's a Christian, you know, a friend of the people that we knew. And it's just kind of like, okay, you know, high-ranking military official, been in there for years and years and years, no desire to get out of it kind of a thing, but he's a saved Bible believer. Sure, you know, when you're enforcing things like don't ask, don't tell, and all the other ungodly laws that have been passed in the military. Now, you know, I certainly believe that there are people in the military that get saved and they see the corruption, they go, whoa, I'm out of here. You know, that's fine. Uh, there are people in the Babel building system that are saved and they see the corruption there and they leave. But we're talking about people that just stay in it and stay in it and stay in it, make excuses for it and, and everything else, and there's no conviction. They put up with a lot of corruption. That's what we question. And again, we're not saying we question your salvation and we're condemning you or we're saying anathema and you're all damned to hell because you disagree with us or something like that. That isn't it at all. Okay. When we say people, we question their salvation, we say, here's how to get saved. All right. And it's faith in Jesus Christ. It's a true relationship with Jesus Christ. And a lot of people don't ever come to that because they aren't broken when they come for salvation. There's a whole bunch of baggage that they're just not willing to let go of. You know, they're just, they're just like, I'm not gonna give up this, this wicked lifestyle that I have. I'm just gonna say, I'll hold on to, you know, I'll be a sodomite Christian. You can't do that. You cannot do that. Uh, when you go into salvation, you might not understand everything that you have to give up or whatever else, sure. But you say, you come to the Lord, you're broken, and you say, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to try to do it to the best of my ability. You know, there's a new life there. All right? So, that's, you know, again, I need to clarify these things. But I saw a lot of you people, you know, there were people in the comments saying, you know, I, I watched just a couple minutes and I get the gist of it. No, 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 no. Watch the whole study. Again, it'd be kind of like you go into a courtroom and the judge up there and, and you, you know, the court case gets started and, and two witnesses come forward and the judge all of a sudden just grabs his gavel and goes guilty boom so uh your honor we didn't present all of our facts yet we didn't present all of our witnesses yet i don't care i've made my judgment would that be a just courtroom and yet that's a, exactly how a lot of you treated my wife and myself i don't appreciate that when i start getting people calling me a false prophet and calling me this and calling me that and i'm work salvationist and all this other nonsense when I start getting that kind of treatment, it ticks me off, all right? It makes me angry, and it makes me realize you're being hasty. Pray about these things, all right? 
you know, again, let me tell you another little story about myself here. And we're going to be looking at a lot of different facts and things here to back up what we said in our insurance study. Years and years ago, when I first got saved and the Lord started to really do things with me and, and uh, you know, I started to study the Bible and everything, I got this thought, you know, and as I was going through the process of sanctification, the Lord was, you know, changing me and changing my attitudes. I was still listening to, you know, Christian rock at the time. And I got on Terry Watkins' website, uh, Dial the Truth Ministries, av1611.org, I think it is. And um, I got on there, and he had articles on against Christian rock. And I was mad. And I thought to myself, how dare he attack that? I mean, there's a lot of people that are getting saved from Christian rock. And I, you know, and I defended it, believe it or not. And uh, But I thought, you know, I'm just going to see what he has to say. And I'm going to look it up with his scriptures, and I'm going to pray about it. And Lord convicted me, and I burned all of my satanic, you know, CCM music. And I had, you know, probably thousands of dollars worth of it. I mean, I had, I had a lot of it. You know, and the Lord's done that time and time again. That's the process of sanctification. You start out with a lot of worldly things, and you end up with very few worldly things, and eventually no worldly things if you get that far. But you start out with little spiritual power, and you end up with more spiritual power. And I thought to myself, you know, way back when, I remember thinking, what would happen if I sold out 100% to the Lord? I'm talking not even having any music that's secular. You say, well, brother, Brian. See, you say, are you there yet? No, I'm not, actually. I still have some secular uh, music and things. Now, it's not worldly, it's not evil or whatever else. And, I'm, and there's debate back and forth, you know. If you have uh, some Strauss or Tchaikovsky or Beethoven or something like that, I don't really consider that stuff to be, you know, going to mess you up or something spiritually. Um, there's a lot of older bluegrass music that I'll listen to. Not stuff about your wife leaving you or something, you know, or cheating and whatever. No, 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 no. I'm just country living type of stuff from the 1930s and things. Debate back and forth whether to get rid of that stuff or not, you know. I don't know. Uh, a lot of my books I've gotten rid of just because I, a lot of this stuff is for documentation. I'll use it to quote things and whatever else. But I'll tell you, the, the process of sanctification, it'll get to, to a point where you, you question things. You say, Lord, is this really pleasing in your sight? And it might take you years to do this. It took me many years, you know, to go through the things that I've gone through. My wife as well. We, we have regular discussions. Should we keep this? What do you think? You know? Uh, there's continuous things that the Lord convicts us and we say, okay, you know, is this right? Is this wrong? And we get rid of it. And we aren't, you know, when we come out and we make a video, we're not making it a salvation thing. You're not saved if you, you know, don't give up, you know, uh, high fructose corn syrup items or something. No, 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 no. It's about, it's about, you know, this stuff is har harming you, okay? Insurance is harming you. All right, insurance is definitely wrong. And I don't care what you say. There's just no basis for it in Scripture. I mean, show me anywhere in Scripture where we are supposed to have lost people ensuring our safety. Uh, it's not in there. And I didn't see anybody trying to debunk the whole thing of surety, uh, which is what the Scriptures are condemning. You know, the Bible says that he that hateth surety ship is sure. I mean... It's right there. But I'm just going to show you a couple little things here. Another other reasons why uh, why I'm against insurance. Why my wife and I are both against insurance. Okay, one of the big reasons, and I saw a brother brought this up, is that insurance is a huge money-making scam. Very, very big money-making scam. Let me show you an article here on the, uh, make sure I have it on yet, but it's on my overhead camera. Top 10 insurance companies by the metrics, investopedia.com. Let me zoom in here a little bit so we can get a better view of this. Okay, market capitalization is the value of the company on a stock exchange. That's how you, what this market capitalization thing is. Large, largest public insurance companies by market capitalization. So in other words, what their stock's uh, value is. Check this out. Non-health insurance companies. Look at the numbers. Berkshire Hathaway, $308 billion. This is what uh, Warren Buffett, 
a big Illuminati man, New World Order goon, and he's this is his company, three hundred eight billion dollars built on people's fears. What if this happens? What if that happens? Three hundred eight billion dollars paying into this thing, and it's not even that old. We're going to show you. I'm going to show you where uh, a lot of the insurance came from. Very interesting. But you can see the other ones there. American International Group, AIG, you hear of that one, $72.3 billion. And again, you know, I need to make the point. Insurance is very much like fractional reserve banking. All right. If you don't know what fractional reserve banking is, I'll explain it. Fractional reserve banking is what we have right now in America. And essentially what they do is you get 20 people that each bring in $10,000. All right, just use these numbers. So the bank is supposed to have $200,000 in the bank. Except the bank says, you know what? We can invest that money because those 20 people aren't going to come in all at the same time and want their $10,000 again. Just all just boom like that. So what they do is they spend a good amount of, amount of that money. And actually, after the that was what caused the first Great Depression. People came in. There was a run on the banks. People started to panic. They came in. They said, I want my money right away. The banks didn't have it. Why? Because they just had a fraction of it in reserve, fractional reserve banking. And so what happened is there was a run on the banks. The banks went out of money, and they said, sorry, we're closed. And the people were going, wait a second. <laughs> I got $10,000 in the bank. Oh, yeah, but you see, there was three people ahead of you that came in, and all we really had was 30000 We spent the other $170,000. <laughs> Sorry about that. And what did that create? See, fractional reserve banking created the first Great Depression. And after that happened, they came out with the Glass-Steagall Act. It was two congressmen or something, and they came out with this act limiting how much money the banks could spend how much of your money the banks could spend. But guess what? During the Bill Clinton years, Glass-Steagall, the Glass-Steagall Act was lifted. So now the banks can go back to spending as much of your money as they want to. And go in sometime and ask the banks. I, I, don't, I haven't done this in a very, very long time, but if you are making a big purchase, go in and ask for about $5,000 or so right in there, or a little bit more. They'll have a hard time getting together. Don't even have five thousand dollars in cash. There are stories of people going in saying, "I need you know twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars." They can't even get it. You know why? Because the banks are spending and everything. It's a big scam. And I know some smarty pants right now is writing a comment. So what do you do? You don't do banking too, huh? You know, yeah, sure. You know, you people get predictable after a while. It gets kind of old. But um, no, I do banking. Uh, why? bills to pay. You have to write checks and things like that. But uh, I'm not foolish enough to think that my money is secure in banks. And of course, we don't have a whole lot of extra money. <laughs> uh, we're not exactly uh, wealthy by American standards, but uh, what money we would have that we would want to save for rough times or whatever, it ain't going to be in the bank. What's well, FDIC insured? Oh yeah, uh, they had the same kind of thing back there with the first Great Depression. Okay. Um, they, they try to keep you suckered into having all your money in there, putting all your money in there. And, you know, the, the bank that I have here uh, in Maine is a lot better. Uh, the people are a lot friendlier and a lot less intrusive uh, asking questions. But the, uh, the bank that I had down in Pennsylvania, they called it the PNC Bank. We call it the Papist Nazi uh, Communists or something like that. You know, we, we came up with not, lots of nice titles for it. But uh, it just crooked. I mean, just what are you doing? Where are you spending your money? I mean, we came to Maine the one time on a vacation, and uh, they they stopped my bank account. Came up and you know it was like we got to get gas and you know get a, a motel room and things. And we were looking for land up here, and it was like, oh sorry, sir, your card's been rejected. And I'm going, I got plenty of money in there. What are you talking about? Get back down to you know Pennsylvania. I went into the bank and I'm like, what in the world happened? Oh, you should have told us that you were going on a trip. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I got to tell you, I'm going on a trip. I mean, just, that's why I advise, okay, you know, I realize people need bank accounts and stuff like that to pay your bills and whatever else. 
but do not keep lots of money in the bank. You're crazy. Okay. They're scamming you. They only have a small portion of that money in there. So you go in and you put all this money, deposit all this money, they're spending it. Getting rich off of your money. You say, how does this relate to the insurance thing? Well, the insurance thing works very much the same way. You get a whole bunch of people suckered into buying insurance and tell them, oh, you'll be safe. Don't worry. You'll be safe. When the hard times come, we'll pay for everything. And then when the hard times do come, they don't many times. And you have a hospital bill or whatever else and it, and it starts to rack up and boy, you really have a sickness or something to take care of and you're terminally ill or something like this. And all of a sudden that wonderful, helpful health insurance program drops you like a hot potato. I've seen it happen so many times. And I'm actually going to show you from their own writings that they even admit to it. We're going to look at that. But let's continue here to show you a couple more. Here you have uh, health insurance and managed health care companies. United Healthcare, $91.8 billion down through there. Look at all that. Billion. Billion. They're getting rich off you people. I have, again, my, my brother-in-law, uh, Tom is his name, Thomas Kuchera, and uh, my wife's older brother. Uh, he's an insurance scammer, uh, salesman, excuse me, and uh, very wealthy. Two different homes. Um, my cousin, I have a cousin, Jenny Fry, uh, my mother's side of the family, and um, her husband, well, I, I think they actually got divorced now, but her former husband, Joe Werbeck, was a former spook, by the way, and then he went into investments and insurance. And, uh, I mean, he's buying whole city blocks in Lancaster City, in the rich section. You know, we're talking multi, multi-millionaire, and he's about maybe a year older than me, you know? Uh, sending all the employees uh, on full paid vacations to Costa Rica the one Christmas. All the people that work for him. I mean, loaded, man. Big time money. My grandfather's funeral. I remember they showed up and they got like this brand new Audi or something. You know, a big old expensive car. Just money, 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 money. Why? Because they're scamming people. That's what it's all about. You're looking at the statistics right here. Look at a couple more. We have property and casualty. State Farm. $50.8 billion. Allstate, Liberty Mutual. Look at that. USAA, if you're in the military there, $10.7 billion is what these people are worth. Life insurance companies. Look at that. All in the billions again. Again, you know, just like with the banking. They know that the majority of people that are just paying all this money in, the majority of people are never even going to use the insurance. So they're just sitting back collecting all this wealth, getting really, really rich. And then when somebody says, oh, i got to file a claim, I had a big problem, you know, something went wrong. It's like, well, you know, well, well, we'll send out some agents and things, and maybe we'll, maybe we'll try to get you a check and things. Mm -hmm. Guardian Life Insurance Company. This, this is again the other one we were looking at there. Health insurance companies. There again, you can see the money they're making off of you. So there you go. That's this article. They have your best interests at heart. Sure. But what about the history of insurance? Here's where it gets interesting. Because I can assure you, it's Bible-believing Christians, the body of Christ. They, they said, we're going to take care of people by forming insurance companies. Right? Wrong. Here we go. You uh, people out there that uh, are hasty and uh, answer matters before you hear it, get ready to start typing your nasty comments because you're going to get some attitude flare-ups here, I'm sure. All right, we have... Zoom in here. FatherMcGivney.org. Who is Father McGivney? There's the old dope, former dope. 
Uh, just about every day, Catholic laymen bound in a common association gather to advance the welfare of their church and communities. Oh, isn't that so nice? These Catholic laymen are the Knights of Columbus, the legacy of Father Michael J. McGivney. Big Knights of Columbus area up here. Okay, There's a lot of them up here. Um, here, the dopey says, uh, this unity of vision and purpose, the secret of the impressive growth of the church in this country, the venerable Michael McGivney, whose vision and zeal led to the establishment of the Knights of Columbus. So the power structure, a lot of the power structure of Catholicism in this country is based upon the Knights of Columbus. How would they get their power? Probably selling, you know, uh, church socials and things like that, right? Uh, no, they have another way of making lots of money. You have any guesses what it might be? I mean, just, you know, let's continue. Father McGivney, creating the Knights of Columbus to provide insurance for the protection of widows and orphans and the spiritual benefit of its members and families. Additionally, the Knights of Columbus ensures the lives of more than 1.2 million men, women, and children. Hmm. So, uh... All the money that's in the insurance scam, the Knights of Columbus are the ones that basically, some of the ones that started it here in America. I'll show you the other group that uh, is big on the insurance thing that's started it. We'll talk about that here as we continue. Father McGivney down here convinced that the Catholic layman had a unique role in influencing society and promoting the values found in what Pope John Paul, well, here, focus for me, where are we at? Uh, the second has since named the culture of life and the civilization of love. Don't you just love the way these Catholics write? It's so funny. Yeah, just murdering people, anathema, you're cursed, you know, and everything, you, you know, heretic, burn the heretic, torture him to death. Culture of life and the civilization of love. <laughs> Give me a break. Father McGivney did not use the vocabulary of the 21st century, but he espoused the same gospel values that Catholics affirm today. Sure he did. Of course. The Catholics are loving people. Here we have history of Father Michael J. McGovney, founder, the Knights of Columbus, Alabama.org. There you go. You can look that up if you want to. Um, check this out. He then moved to Montreal to attend seminary classes at the Jesuit-run St. Mary's College. I have one of the books from the that uh, it's the church teaches. I've shared it in other studies. It's up there. I'm not going to get it right now, but um, and they talk about. I mean, there's like 300 something anathemas for the heretics, you know, in the thing. Caught here of love. <laughs> sure. In 1881, he began to explore the various laymen, or with various laymen, the idea of a Catholic fraternal benefit society. Uh, strengthen religious faith and at the same time provide for the financial needs of families overwhelmed by illness or death of the breadwinner. Just like a lot of you people put in your comments. Oh, I'd hate to think of what would happen to my wife and children if, if, if something happened to me. Oh, i got to have life insurance because, you know, God can't provide. Oh, that's not, oh, I don't believe it. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Stinking hypocrites, you? Yes, you do. Don't even tell me about it. Here you have the Mass or Massachusetts Catholic Order of Foresters, the Catholic Benefit Legion. Sounds like nice stuff. Very much like the Masons. That's what they were in competition with. Father McGivney had suggested Sons of Columbus as a name for the order. This would bind Catholicism and Americanism together through the faith and bold vision of the New World's discoverer, Christopher Columbus, in other words. Apply a noble ritual in support of the emerging calls of Catholic civil liberty. I love that. The Orders of Principles in 1882 were unity and charity, fraternity and patriotism. The Columbus linked themes, uh, linked themes says, historian Christopher J. Kaufman reverberated with pride in the American promise of liberty, equality, and opportunity. In April of 1882, Father McGivney down here orders primary objective he wrote was to dissuade catholics from joining secret societies by providing them better advantages 
at times of death or sickness. Insurance. That's what they made. That's how they became the most powerful Catholic society in America, according to Pope Benedict. Later, from 1901 to 1939, his younger brothers, uh, I, I think it's a French, Monsignors or something like that, Patrick and John J. McGivney, or served the order as supreme chaplains. You gotta love these titles these knuckleheads give themselves. Most worshipful master, supreme chaplain. Oh, shut up. You know, get down on your knees and repent, you dirty sinner, before you end up in hell burning forever. I mean, the founder of the Knights of Columbus, talking about that. Uh, from the moment he launched it, the organization fortified Catholics in their faith, offered them ways to greater financial security in a sometimes hostile world, and strengthened them in self-esteem. <laughs> yeah. The Knights of Columbus today combines Catholic fraternalism and one of the most successful American insurance enterprises. Uh, uh, oh, boy. The four towers of the international headquarters symbolize the order's worldwide commitment to charity, unity, fraternity, and patriotism. Uh, the board of directors in 1988, uh, they have a room named for the Knights of Columbus uh, within the ancient St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Father McGivney's polished granite sarcophagus, a shrine for pilgrim knights where the order began. Yeah, the pagans always like to, you know, worship they're dead uh, heroes. Show you a couple more things here quick. Here we have Knights of Columbus. That does not say KFC, so don't put in your order for chicken there, okay? But here it says, learn about us. Thanks to the efforts of Father Michael J. McGivney, the Connecticut State Legislature of March 29th, uh, 29th, 1882, officially chartered the Knights of Columbus as a fraternal benefit society. The Knights were uh, was formed to render financial aid to members and their families. Mutual aid and assistance are offered to sick, disabled, and needy members and their families. The order has helped families obtain economic security and stability through its life insurance, annuity, and long-term care programs. Other Our principles here. Fraternity. The Venerable Michael J. McGivney founded the Knights of Columbus in large part to provide assistance to the widows and children left behind when the family breadwinner died, often prematurely. The order's top-rated insurance program continues to this day, or to this today, or to do this today, excuse me. Good one. Knightsofcolumbus.org, why choose us? The Knights of Columbus is a fraternal benefit society protecting families since 1882. There is no more highly rated insurer in North America than the Knights of Columbus. AM Best has bestowed on us their highest rating, A++ Superior, for 39 consecutive years. Check this out. We are secure. Since 1882, we have been committed to protecting the financial futures of our knights and their families, paying claims and dividends to our insured members. We are stable. Our owners are our members, and we return our good fortune in the form of dividends to our policy holders. So if you're a good Catholic, you can join up with that thing there, and, and you can actually make a little bit of extra money there. It's, say, how's that work? Insurance, question and answer. What exactly are dividends? Dividends are the divisible surplus the order has left over after paying expenses and setting aside the necessary amounts to assure that future benefits are fully funded. Yeah, right. Remember, the pay payments of, payment of dividends cannot be guaranteed. In other words, uh, they're paying in, but you're not guaranteed that they're going to pay out when you need it. What are they doing with the money? Fractional Reserve Banking come to mind? Billions and billions and billions of dollars? If they're the number one insured or insurance company in America, um, how much are they worth? 
and how many of those uh, other insurance companies that I showed earlier there, the market capitalization thing, how many of those are owned by the Knights of Columbus? They own them, but they just kind of retain the name to make people think that they're not connected to the Knights of Columbus. Something in it. Again, you have knightsofcolumbus.org, history. There he is. He's dead and in hell now. Um, Venerable Michael McGivney, founder of the Knights of Columbus, New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, establishing, establishing a lay organization to unite men of Catholic faith and to provide for the families of deceased members as a symbol that allegiance in, to their country did not conflict with allegiance to their faith. The organization's members took as their patron Christopher Columbus, recognized as a Catholic and celebrated as the discoverer of America. The Knights of Columbus, um, in 1882, officially assumed corporate status on March 29th. So yeah, they're a corporation as well. Imagine that. Next page here, 1892, the order passes laws allowing non-insurance or associate members to join. So, hey, you know, you can get into this thing if you're not even a Catholic, I guess, apparently. 1895, the Vatican's first acknowledgement of the Knights comes with when Archbishop Francisco Satoli, uh, apostolic delegate to the United States, writes a letter extolling the merits of this splendid Catholic organization and giving the order his apostolic blessing. 1895. How long has your insurance company been in business? No connection to the Knights of Columbus, I'm sure, though. Here we have, again, knightsofcolumbus.org. 1961 to 1978, into the mainstream. During this time... The Order's insurance program also began to a period of dramatic growth. The amount of insurance in force tripled from $1 billion to $3 billion from 1960 to 1975. Hmm. How about that? Very interesting. You say, well, you know, I don't think that my insurance company came from the Knights of Columbus. I don't, I don't believe that it came from that. Let me show you another little story here that you might find rather interesting. Here we, here we have the character claims and practical workings of Freemasonry by Charles G. Finney, 1869. And we're going way back here. Read a little story for you. Zoom in here. The irony of all ironies is that shortly following the ransacking of Mrs. Morgan's house by three Masons and the murder of her husband by three others, benevolent Freemasonry came to her financial aid. James Ganson, who was directly involved with the abduction of her husband, visited Mrs. Morgan, assuring her that Freemasonry was making arrangements for her support, that she would be well provided for, that her children would be sent to school as soon as they were old enough. Isn't that nice of them? murdered her husband, and then they said, oh, we'll come in and help you. Mm -hmm. After Freemasonry determined how they were going to care for Mrs. Morgan and her children, they appointed Thomas McCauley to deliver the message. McCauley, you recall, was one of the three Masons who had bullied their way into her house, ransacking it in their attempt to find the manuscript to her husband's book. McCauley informed Mrs. Morgan that Freemasonry had raised support for her family and had provided board for them at a public tavern in the village. The... Tavern was the, the same at which her husband had been detained after his arrest. Six months after the murder of her husband, Henry Brown of Batavia, who was Grand Commander of the Knights Templar at Leroy, New York, called on Mrs. Morgan and handed her a bag containing silver dollars that had been collected from the various lodges through, throughout the state. Her distress of mind and unprotected situation did not sway her to bow to their hypocritical benevolence, Without hesitation, she said, I shall accept no assistance from the Masons. But Bible-believing Christians today do. And the Lord's okay with that, huh? Why don't you pray about it? Instead of getting mad and writing a bunch of stupid nonsense down in the comments, why don't you pray about it? 
See what the Lord would have you to do. And I know a lot of people, you know, they're coming along and they're going, hey, it's food for thought. I, you know, I never really thought of these arguments before. And they, I'm not telling you you have to convert just because I said to. Good night. You know, the authority is the Bible. Pray about it. Pray about it. Ask the Lord. Do I really want to have my insurance, myself taken care of by Masons and Knights of Columbus? And I guarantee you, there's nobody in that list that I showed you earlier, the cap carpet, uh, market capitalization. There's nobody in that list that's not Masonic or Catholic. You're not going to get up into those realms. They're going to let you get up there as an independent company and they go, oh, you know, welcome to the big, you know, thing. They'd run you out of business. So you're giving your money. You're making Catholics and Masons wealthy by joining up with the insurance agencies. Hmm. But uh, there's another reason why I'm against insurance. And that is because I used to have it. What? Oh, you're a hypocrite. Oh, well, I had it when I was lost. Okay? And I didn't understand the situation back in those days. But you see, uh, what the insurance did for me was it encouraged me to live an unhealthy lifestyle. You see, back when I was a young man, um, when I was in high school, I was working at a um, Strasburg Railroad. I was a, in cooking and things like that. I, I was a cook on a train, a historical train. I'd go you know, down and, and I'd cook on this train. There was a dining car restaurant. I was one of the first young people to cook on that. There was, a, there was also a little restaurant called the dining car, uh, separate from the train. It was there at the station and you could eat in there. And they had, you know, the typical like fast food type of, foods and I cooked there. I started out as a bus boy then I moved to the cash registers then I went back and I started to cook and then they put me on the train and everything else and, and so I worked there I think five years on and off through my high school years and I would work other jobs too during my high school time uh, cabinet making and other restaurants and things and um, got out of high school and I went to work for a and they didn't provide any kind of health insurance back in those years. That was in the 1990s. And uh, I got out of high school and it was like the big drive. You know, get a good job that has good health care. You know, you got to get health care, you know, health coverage and all this stuff. You got to have a good insurance program. That's worth more than, you know, high hourly rate. So I went out and I worked at a place called Susquehanna Sante Boat Works in Willow Street. And uh, they've, I think that they've gone belly up since then, but... Um, the management there was just terrible. But uh, anyways, I went to work there. And at the time, I was into extreme sports. I was like Mr. Motorcycle, fast motorcycle guy, ATVs, dirt bikes, you know, fast cars, fast trucks, whatever else, anything with speed, adrenaline junkie, you know, kind of deal. And, um, and I lived very, very dangerously. And I drank... I think about a case of Dr. Pepper every week there. I was drinking a gallon at a time uh, just about every day or every other day, a gallon of iced tea, Turkey Hill iced tea, iced tea down there. Really, really bad stuff. I mean, just like corn syrup with a, a hint of tea, you know, <laughs> it was bad. And uh, I just unhealthy. I mean, the, this place, this factory I worked in, it was lined with asbestos. I mean, we were using all these toxic chemicals. I ended up, um, my appendix burst because it was just so toxic in there. I mean, it, it was, it was a bad situation and my appendix burst and I went to the hospital and I was, you know, oh, I got health insurance and all this other stuff. And, um, you know, you say, well, why did you, you know, so then the insurance was there for you. Well, the insurance was there for me because you see, I, I could have cared less how I was living. Uh, now that I don't have insurance and I, I, ended up leaving there about 1996 I left there about two years after working there 96 97 right in there and I didn't I haven't had health insurance since then and what has happened is it has forced me to live a more careful life you see back in when I had my health insurance I just kind of was like you know I'm, I'm like a machine basically um, I can put whatever chemicals into my body I want I can drive or ride motorcycles as fast as I want and I did 175 miles an hour the one time on my street bike. 
Um, it was a Ninja ZX-11, which was the fastest thing out there in the 1990s before the Suzuki Hayabusa came out, but another story. Um, and it was it was built had all kinds of motor work done to it and whatever else and you know it was very very fast capable of well over 200 miles an hour and you know I was doing this on the on the road and not some closed circuit you know street bike racing track and I would you know make it a habit you know oh I would always do 150 miles an hour when I was out ever out riding my bike I mean I was I was crazy why I had health insurance I could live recklessly because, hey, if something bad happens to me, I'll just get patched up. You know, they'll scrape me off the road, take me to the hospital, and my, I'll just get, you know, if I can, as long as I can get my little, you know, my card out, my health card out, or they can dig it out of my wallet, you know, uh, it'll be all covered. No problem. So it encouraged me to live unhealthy. But now that I have no health insurance, now that we have no health insurance, now I have to think about it. Now I have to be more careful. You see, and it's, I mentioned the same thing about the thing of, of vehicle insurance. You know, people say you have to have car insurance. I understand that. But you don't have to have full coverage. You see? You understand? Okay? If I get into an accident, if I'm careless, and I drive stupid behind the wheel, I'm speeding or doing some kind of dumb thing, and I wreck one of my vehicles, it's my loss. But if you have full covered insurance, well, you know, hey, it, it can be covered if, if, of course, they pay out. So see, the philosophy is all wrong. It's totally wrong. When you have no health insurance, you have to force yourself to say, okay, I need to take care of myself. It's not about, you know, you just kind of live and you're sick all the time and you just kind of wander through life and you're just sickly in it. No, 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 no. I live healthier now. After wrecking my life, after wrecking my health for years, mostly through the years of me being in my 20s, even after I was, you know, left and I didn't have health insurance, I still wasn't living very carefully because I didn't understand a lot of healthy living things. But now, since I've been saved, since the Lord's brought me into ministry, since the Lord brought my wife into my life, we're, you know, constantly, okay, watching what we eat and everything else. Why? There's no insurance there. But we have assurance that the Lord's going to take care of us. And the Lord does. I mean, the Lord protects us. He's protected us so many times, it's amazing. We truly get to see His miraculous power in our lives. But when you have insurance, the Lord's pushed out. And again, you know, oh, you know, how dare you say such things? I experienced it. I experienced it. Don't even tell me about it. I mean, and you know something else that's also pretty bad about this whole thing? Not only when you are putting your money into these multi-billion dollar Catholic and Masonic organizations, when you're putting billions, you know, well, not you, but, you know, when you're putting money into it and they're getting, amassing billions of dollars in wealth, you know what else you're doing? You are also providing the funding for other people to live unhealthy. You might live totally healthy and never even use your insurance policy, but the fact is, you are perpetuating a system that is causing other people to live unhealthy. They're paying for it. Do you ever think of that? You know, and again, uh, you say, well, what would we do? What would we do without health insurance? Well, when I was in Honduras years ago, uh, they didn't have health insurance down there. People were too poor for it. So hospitals worked on a cash basis. And the missionaries that we were staying with down there uh, they actually went to, um, I think it was Tegucigalpa, the, the city down there. Uh, San Pedro Sula is the main city, but then there was Tegucigalpa was the, where they were stationed at. And the wife had to have a, it was fairly major surgery, it was like a hysterectomy or something, $400. And it was a nice hospital. They took us to the thing, showed us it and stuff. It was a very, very nice hospital. Very modern and everything else. 400 bucks. This would have been... Oh, probably late 1990s, probably about 98, 99, somewhere in there, $400. And again, you know, you go into the hospital, you, I remember when I went in and they had my appendectomy thing, um, I remember it was like ridiculous, you know, they'd come in and they'd say, are you in pain? And I'd be like, you know, I was like half out of it and I'm like, yeah, and they'd, they'd give me morphine. You know, I didn't even know what it was at the time, you know, and and... I'll say more about morphine some other time. It's bad stuff. But, uh, 
you know, they, they give me this morphine thing. And I remember I got the health insurance bill thing at the end. And, you know, what's what they pay for $7,500 for those shots. Just a couple shots of morphine. $7,500. You know, you say, I have a headache. And they say, oh, here's an aspirin. You get the bill. It's like 150 bucks for an aspirin or something. One aspirin. Or, you know, see, it's out of hand. It's all a big money-making scam. Why are Christians part of it? I have to ask you that. Why are you part of this? Why are you going along with it? Why can't you rely on God to take care of you? Why can't you work out your own health? You know? Do you ever think about that? You know, I'll give you another little story here. If you are familiar with this ministry, you know that I struggle majorly with headaches. And I'm talking bad headaches. Migraine, you know, the worst. I mean, I get sick. I'm half delirious when I get a headache and things like that. Now, what would happen if I had health insurance? I'd go to the doctor. Doctor, I got a really bad headache. He'd say, well, let me check your blood pressure. Oh, it's a little bit elevated. And I do check my own blood pressure. I have the equipment to do that. You know, I monitor my own health. And, uh, but I go to the doctor. Oh, I got it, you know. I have, I have high blood pressure, slightly high blood pressure. The doctor says, I'm going to give you a prescription. I come back in, that's, that's not helping. Well, let me up your prescription. Well, maybe I can give you, and I say, you know, but I, I, I feel nauseous now too. Well, I can give you another prescription for that, to bring that nausea down. And away you go. You see? You're being treated like your chemicals. You know why I was having headaches, a lot of my headaches? And, you know, I'm still working on this whole thing, you know. Um, first of all, my body's been detoxing from, you know, almost 30 years of being destroyed through the wrong kind of food. Uh, really bad stuff. Now we have a whole food slash raw food diet that we eat. Um, it's just I'm in better health now than I've ever been, just in a couple short years. Uh, and herbal remedies and things like that. I mean, it's amazing. You can literally destroy your health for years and years and years, and you'll see a dramatic improvement when you start to eat right. And of course, prayer is a major thing. You know, don't want to get ahead of myself here, but uh, prayer is very important. But uh, you'll see this thing of your life changing. And so I've been experimenting with things and, you know, a lot of you have written some really helpful advice and you say, well, take some baking soda and water and I've tried that and it works sometimes if it's, if I can catch it early enough. Other times if the headache goes too far, it doesn't work. Um, pumpkin seeds, raw pumpkin seeds uh, that are uh, non-salted. Also very helpful for headaches. Um, I'm starting now a new uh, thing in my diet of green tea, black tea and uh, fever fuel. Uh, drinking that on a daily basis and not heated up either. I mean, just like brewed with the, the sun, you know, I mean, just a little bit of heat from sunlight and, you know, it'll get nice and dark and everything else too. I'd put a gallon of, you know, in a glass jar, a gallon of, of purified water and, you know, uh, and, you know, I go off on all this stuff. But the point is I'm trying things. It's experimentation. You try this and you try that and, and you know, it's like, well, this doesn't work and that doesn't work and, well, let's try this and let's try that. But we had this type of salt that was this uh, Himalayan type of salt and got it locally here and that stuff was giving me headaches. Now, see, if I had a total doctor, they'd have said, well, you're high blood pressure. You can't have salt. You have to cut salt completely out of your diet. That wasn't it at all. It was just the wrong kind of salt. So I started to use like a gray type of a sea salt I'm fine. No headaches. See, what's my point? My point is ex it's experimentation. You try new things. You have a child that has an earache. You say, okay, uh, first of all, let's pray about this. You get down, you pray, and then you say, all right, let's look into natural health cures for earaches. What might be the problem? Are you eating fast food? Um, here's a thought. Are you living in sin? I once did, back as a lost man, I was living in all kinds of sin, you know. Again, uh, different times I had to go to the hospital when I did not have an insurance, you know, accidents I had, it was a direct result of my sin. I was messing around with different things that I shouldn't have been messing around with, and that sin, God corrected me. 
You see? I mean, what are the different things there? You start to work those things out. You say, okay, well, I'm not really messing around with sin, and, and I haven't, you know, we cut out fast food, and we cut out the uh, uh, soda, pop, whatever you want to call it there. You know, we cut that out. We cut out this. We cut out that, you know, and we're eating better now and whatever else. That right there is going to improve your health dramatically. But then you start to say, okay, let's do some research. What do you do if you have a hard time sleeping at night? Well, this herb here, that herb there. Let's try this. Let's try that. What about headaches? What about, uh, you know, constant fever? What about digestion problems? What about this? What about that? Research. Research. And you start to get control of your body. You start to get control of your health. You don't need health insurance. Okay? You really don't need health insurance. And again, you know, people, oh, well, but the government forces it. You know... Again, it's a real good thing that Christians are not going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble because a lot of Christians would take the mark of the beast because it's going to be government forced. You know, he's going to cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark. You know, and there'd be a lot of people, a lot of Christians would be like, well, you know, but I got to provide for my family and I, I you know, I'm going to do this and that. I mean, what, what kind of a legacy are we going to be leaving for people that go into the time of Jacob's trouble? Those saints that go into that time. Oh, I remember uh, so-and-so. Yeah, I guess they were saved. They went up in this whatever thing happened. And uh, yeah, they, they were nice people. And they had insurance policies. And they had this. And they had that and everything. And, you know, I, again, the point was raised in the study. And that is it's a great stumbling block to the lost. And a lot of people got offended by that, you know. And, oh, why would you say a thing like that? Because you're no different than the lost world. Hey, we have faith. I believe by faith that God can protect me as long as my insurance premiums are paid up. What? But let me show you a little New Testament thing here. I did not put this in the other study. You know, I mean, the book of Job. What do you do with the book of Job if you believe in insurance policies? You know, no insurance. God totally allows him to be wiped out, completely wiped out. I mean, health failing and, you know, family wiped out and everything else, and God restores it all. What do you do with that? You believe in insurance. You're big, you know, I believe God can use insurance. Why write the book of Job? Let me show you a little New Testament thing here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the insurance company, oh, I'm sorry, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Unless you have insurance. Because then you can get rid of weakness. You just go to the hospital anytime you have weakness. Get it worked out. Get your little prescription for the drugs. And then everything gets happy. Right? Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Do you want Christ's power? And again, you know, another little thing in the comments. You should be preaching the gospel. You should be preaching the gospel. Um, I find it so ironic that people tell me I should be preaching the gospel, not wasting my time on secondary issues. Um, you're wasting your time posting comments. Uh, isn't that kind of hypocrisy? I mean, you know, come on. But let me just end with a verse here. 2 Timothy chapter 4. A lot of you really prove this scripture to me. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 4 says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. You know what you do as a Bible-believing Christian? Back in the book of Psalms, it says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You know, if I was a Christian and I had an insurance policy, 
and I believed it was right, I wouldn't care what some preacher said about it. I'd just look and I'd say, oh, you know, okay, this, this study isn't for me. But some of you that got your uh, toes stepped on, a lot of you, you're under conviction. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and saying, convicting you and saying, do you really need that insurance? You better think about that. You better pray about it. Why don't you do that? Why don't you pray and say, Lord, do you really want me to have this insurance policy? Is this really something that is of you? I showed you the proof it's been founded by Masons and the Knights of Columbus, Jesuits. I showed you the proof that it's a multi-billion, with a B, billion dollar industry. It's fake. And by the way, what do you think is going to happen to the insurance companies during the time of Jacob's trouble? When the whole world has fallen apart? Are you going to be in good hands with Allstate at that time? And I realize, you know, oh, we're not going to be here. I know that. I know that. I know. But uh, all that money that you put into it, is that being a good steward of God's resources that he's given you? Boy, you better think about that. So that's going to be it. Uh, post your comments away. You know, go ahead. Take a good shot. You know, whatever. But uh, I really do pray that if, if you're out there and you're really starting to think about this, you know, give it some thought. I'll tell you, it'll change your life when you start to actually realize, hey, you know what? My health is something that I can't rely on some doctor to take care of. I've got to start working this stuff out between myself and the Lord. And there are times I'm going to be sick and there isn't going to be a cure. And by the way, we had this other comment from a Marie, which ironically is my mother-in-law's name. And there was no email address, so I don't know who she was, but uh, it was on Sermon Audio. And she's like, oh, you know, you, you need to go through the purifying, you know, times of suffering and things. And you're young and in perfect health. Oh, honey, <laughs> I'm not in perfect health. Neither is my wife. Okay. We've gone through some things. We don't talk about a lot of it. But uh, I have a heart condition. I've had all kinds of different health problems. I've been in the hospital before. I'm not in perfect health. Okay. I know about pain. So don't tell me, oh, if you had pain, then you'd want health insurance. Nonsense. Absolute total nonsense. So, just something to think about, brethren. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to condemn people to hell because you have insurance, okay? Don't lie about me, all right? If you don't like this study, go watch something else, all right? Don't feel that you need to put me down in the comments or put my wife down in the comments. Just move on. Move on. Go get something else to watch, all right? So, that's going to be it on the whole subject of insurance. I pray that you will pray to the Lord and ask for His guidance. Thank you for watching.